Yes, we are live. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our first webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on international cooperation and, and development cooperation. <clears throat> My name is Stefan Klingebiel. I'm heading the UNDP Seoul Policy Center. Uh, COVID-19 is a global crisis. It is a global health crisis. And as we all know, uh, we have a health uh, uh, emergency situation in all parts of the world. The health crisis comes along or will be followed by other, other crisis situations. We see the immediate blow of the crisis, especially on developing countries. At the same time, we understand that the crisis is going to affect fundamentally how international cooperation and development cooperation are organized. We saw already over the last couple of years a rising paradox. On the one hand, an increasing need for more and better international and transnational cooperation because of pressing global challenges. Just to remind you about um, last year's uh, debates on climate change, I think um, last year became uh, a very visible year that climate change um, challenges are pressing. On the other hand, um, we experienced over the last couple of years a decreasing ability of the international community um, for collective action. Um, this is a debate about shrinking multilateral approaches. We probably all expect that the COVID-19 crisis will fundamentally be a game changer, including what we see in terms of consequences for international cooperation and, and development cooperation. We do not know today all aspects. Um, nevertheless, we know that uh, we need to get a better understanding of the consequences and we need to sharpen this debate in order to inform decision makers. In my view, we should try to deal with at least five main dimensions of the topic. The first one is the rational and the narrative of international cooperation <clears throat> and development cooperation. Um, development cooperation is dealing with, traditionally dealing with challenges in developing countries and um, what we are now seeing is a big push in terms of um, that this kind of cooperation should um, increasingly uh, try to uh, focus on the provision of, of global public goods. So this kind of debate which was um, initiated by Inge Kaul and by others. Um, we also see um, that um, COVID-19 related investments uh, need to be huge and uh, what we need to take on board are the consequences in terms of uh, climate change aspects. So how to bring together those different uh, narratives. Related to those aspects, um, we need to reflect on our binary system thinking that we have on the one hand, developing countries and on the other hand, uh, developed countries. As a second main dimension, I would like to uh, mention here that um, we need to reflect on global governance arrangements and um, uh, uh, development cooperation governance uh, uh, institutional settings. So the whole question, how this system of the United Nations can deal with this kind of crisis. How about our club governance approaches, G20, G8, G7, and, and others. And as we all know, after main uh, crisis situations, after the main financial crisis um, 2008, we saw um, um, emerging new institutional setting. We had a similar situation after World War II, et cetera. So the question is what kind of um, new institutional setting are we going to face against the background of COVID-19? The third aspect I want to um, mention here is something what we should deal with, um, the whole question about um, appropriate strategies. Um, I think what we are going to see increasingly is uh, competition um, when it comes to main priorities, how to, how to deal with um, this kind of ranking, what is most important. 
We have to deal with uh, strategic challenges, let's say, with regard to governance and human rights when it comes to uh, um, uh, the effectiveness of, of countries, how to implement strategies. We have um, trade-offs um, when it comes to, um, to other aspects. Let's just uh, mention here um, the whole debate about implications of a deglobalization process. As a fourth topic, I would like to mention the, uh, the question of resources, financial and non-financial resources. We all know that um, better off OECD countries are planning to invest huge uh, resources. At the same time, we see already a tremendous investment need in poor countries, in developing countries. How to deal with this kind of new dimension of, of investment need so this will be also a very important question. My fifth and last point here, modalities and operational aspects. Um, what we also see already on the ground in many developing countries is a new need for uh, coordination. All these actors um, trying to deal with the situation. Uh, this is very important. We have a new push when it comes to the localization of aid. So this is just to, to frame a bit um, five main aspects of this kind of discussion. Um, we were thinking that this debate is already needed now uh, because we want to try to contribute to sharpen this debate. We approached a number of think tank representatives and we received a great readiness by, by our colleagues um, to contribute to this debate, to kick off. So this is why we are really glad to have a number of high ranking uh, think tank representatives uh, contributing to our first webinar, but also to our next two webinars. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Artemi, my colleague Artemi, who is going to moderate um, the first uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stefan, for framing uh, the discussion. And before I hand over uh, to the panelists, I wanted to thank all the participants, we already have more than 120 and growing uh, right now. Uh, and I would like to say that you have two options for asking questions. Well, first of all, you can raise your hand. Uh, there is an option of raising your hand in uh, um, the Zoom. And the second option is uh, using the Q&A uh, function. Uh, the, uh, questions will be seen by the panelists and uh, we will do our best uh, to um, answer them in the end of the um, uh, discussion. So uh, we will start uh, by uh, the intervention of uh, Pilanim Tembu. He is the executive director of the Institute for uh, Global Dialogue at UNISA uh, in South Africa that is currently in uh, lockdown. Uh, so Pilani, the floor is yours. Pilani, please unmute yourself. <laughs> I could hear myself, but you couldn't hear me. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you first for the introduction and the overview, uh, Stefan, and then also thank you, Atemi. Um, for leading us into this uh, panel. Um, you've actually assisted in terms of uh, framing, I think, some of the interventions that are going to be uh, coming in. So what I'm going to be using is um, at least what I've prepared, but actually organizing it in those five um, uh, points that uh, Stefan actually uh, mentioned, or at least some of those five points. I think International cooperation um, in the, let's say, thinking about post-COVID and thinking about how countries, and not just countries, but also uh, various actors have been responding within the COVID um, a, 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 a pandemic. Um, I think in terms of narratives on international cooperation and development cooperation, what I found interesting is how the pandemic is actually accentuating some of the trends that we were already witnessing uh, prior uh, to the pandemic. So challenges around uh, multilateralism, 
challenges around international cooperation, uh, international solidarity, uh, all those debates are being accentuated by what we are seeing uh, within uh, uh, COVID. And this is affecting a whole range of, uh, of, of, of regions uh, within the world. Um, but also I think what we're seeing is this idea that um, thinking about the 2030 agenda, for instance, and how different countries have uh, proportional responsibilities. We've been noting for some time that South-South uh, uh, cooperation is taking on a much greater role. But increasingly, what we are also seeing is not just South-South cooperation, but also South-North cooperation. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, what some of the countries within the Global South, how they have been responding within, uh, in, in, in tackling uh, COVID-19, is that they are not only focusing their cooperation within their own regions. Um, so China, which was you know, the first epicenter, now moving out and, 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 and playing a greater role in, in, in pledging and enacting solidarity with other countries. Um, Cuba, um, you know, demonstrating uh, its solidarity um, you know, within this uh, global pandemic, um, watching how countries, various countries within the Global South have been responding, I think has been interesting. Uh, Kenya, for instance, already now you, you, you're finding uh, there was an interesting um, uh, observation the other day of how uh, uh, garment factories were re-engineering what they are doing for the local market and essentially saying uh, we normally import some of these things from, from China and, 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 and other countries. And right now, demand is growing and we need to build the capabilities within to produce for our local market, but also for a broader market. So I found those you know, things quite interesting, that blurring of, um, uh, on, on solidarity and watching how countries from the South have been approaching it, but also how countries from the North themselves have also been um, uh, uh, grappling, you know, with some of these uh, questions. Uh, in terms of global governance, uh, we're seeing that COVID-19 has accentuated the challenges of global governance. Uh, I mean, look what is happening with the um, uh, criticisms leveled towards the World Health Organization uh, by, you know, various members of the um, uh, United States uh, administration, um, and 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 you know, and and also uh, saying that they will withdraw uh, funding, also, or at least thinking about withdrawing uh, funding. Uh, these, all of these things, are demonstrating uh, latent trends that were already there prior, but are actually being accentuated by uh, 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 COVID-19. And that's posing interesting challenges for things like club governance. Um, so for instance, you, 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 you see that the IMF has uh, uh, introduced various uh, financial tools uh, for countries to deal with um, uh, COVID-19. But as that was also happening, we're having a very interesting debate within South Africa whether South Africa should actually go to the IMF or whether South Africa should use an institution like the New Development Bank of, 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 of the BRICS, uh, which has also uh, opened you know, a, a facility for BRICS countries uh, totaling a billion uh, uh, US dollars, uh, which can be made available to a country like South Africa. So within the new development bank, South Africa can access funding of uh, around $2 billion uh, this year. So if they want to, they can actually access it. They have options. Um, um, and it's been interesting following that discussion, you know, where you had 
um, some policymakers thinking automatically uh, the IMF is, is, is the place to go, but having that backlash and saying, no, let's not just think about the IMF, let's look at all the range of uh, financial tools that are available. And that's telling us also this accentuation of trends that we've been seeing prior to COVID-19, but actually being brought more uh, to the surface. And, and it's going to test, obviously, the UN uh, system. It's going to test club governance uh, to see who is geared up to actually uh, 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 deal with a post-COVID uh, landscape. And I think it's interesting also looking at strategies. The point that Stefan was also making is that there's no blueprint on how countries have been responding uh, to COVID-19. There's good examples in countries that uh, are democratic. Uh, there's good examples in countries that are more authoritarian um, in how they've actually covered and, and responded you know, to COVID-19 and, 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 and what it tells about the efficiencies of their respective systems. Um, you know, you've had uh, countries you know, like the US, which earlier, uh, uh, you know, you people are saying they, they, they should have uh, responded uh, quicker. So it's interesting to see how that uh, plays out within uh, the, the, the pandemic, but also beyond uh, this era. And then the last two points is on the financial and non-financial resources, which I've partly touched on this availability of more resources. I spoke about the new development bank, but the Asia Infrastructure uh, uh, Investment Bank is also, for instance, uh, uh, availing uh, various tools. There's various instruments within not only the Global South, but the Global North that are available for countries to utilize. Uh, even in the US itself, the US is making funds available globally. Uh, to you. So there's this uh, growing pluralism uh, and, and uh, of, of, of options, I think, for countries uh, to basically uh, choose from. And then the last point on coordination is that COVID-19 has showed how uh, 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 difficult uh, coordination has been, particularly in a, a dealing with something that requires self, you know, uh, uh, distancing. Um, and I think countries have found it, countries have gone into self-quarantine, uh, if I could put it, you know, that way. But then as countries go into self-quarantine, we're finding new forms of cooperation that are emerging, uh, meetings uh, taking place in different uh, uh, ways. Um, so within Africa, for instance, um, in, in the Southern African Development Community, but also within the African Union, various meetings have been going on to coordinate efforts within the African continent. And lastly, also on, on Africa, is to keep in mind that African countries have been dealing with pandemics for uh, a number of years with very limited resources. And, um, and, 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 what this, will, what this will show us is that you, there are also lessons that can be learned from African countries and broader from developing countries at dealing with issues of international cooperation. Let me leave it there. Thank you very much, Pilani. These are uh, very uh, important uh, points. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, let's uh, go to the next speaker, and uh, uh, this is going to be Zhang Chuanghong uh, from the China Agricultural University. Uh, Zhang Hong, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, you think I can use my PPT? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. Um, uh, if you have I, problems with the screen sharing, I can just do it for you. I have your presentation open here. The, the, the latest one, right? The new yes. version. Okay, yes. please. Thank you. Sure. I, I, I just couldn't find it. it. It said I'm not allowed to 
share the screen. <laughs> um, it should be on now. Um, it's okay. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Just guide us on how to uh, turn the, the slides. All right. So. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, uh, Artemi. Um, hi, colleagues. Um, it's my great honor to be this in this uh, web webinar. It's my first one, <laughs> so I prepare um, a PPT. I will strictly follow uh, the instructions given prior to this webinar. I will going to talk about these four issues. The first one scenario, second, mitigating collateral med uh, damage, the third one, a strengthening momentum and at last I will try to envision um, what development co cooperation post COVID-19 would be like. Yeah. Next slide please. Yeah, you know this COVID-19 is unprecedented. I think we never had experienced something like this. And its impact is fundamental. You know, it's not just about a health system crisis, but also political and security challenge. Um, no man is an island in time of itself. We see we are all connected. We are suffering this negative impact of globalization and socially, economically. Um, and for China, you know, even the, 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 the epidemic is subsiding, but we are still facing challenges and the production activities are resuming, but we are still facing um, the challenges of export. Uh, and our government didn't set any GDP growth rate target this year, and the G20 growth forecast is negative, zero, uh, negative 2.2. So from this, if we think about development cooperation, we need to think about, can we still have development cooperation without globalization? This is an emerging question and uh, we need to think about it seriously. Next slide, please. And um, I agree with Filani, you know, you mentioned this kind of um, a change is, uh, has happened even prior this COVID-19. And the first one, I think the traditional donor recipient paradigm is fundamentally disrupted. And any country could be a donor and a recipient, and it could be both at the same time. And China received um, aid from more than 70 countries, I think, and most of them are developing countries. Uh, and now China is providing uh, aid to more than 100 countries. So no matter they are developed or developing. So this kind of donor recipient paradigm, I think is fundamentally disrupted and it's not reversed. Uh, and the second, you, you also uh, mentioned the international institutions norms were severely weakened due to this kind of travel restrictions. Even for UN's peace, peacekeeping activities, you know, people in um, urgent need of um, intervention, the doubt about, you know, um, you know that the, the helpers might bring virus as well. So, and also the moral base for cooperation is at risk and the countries are struggling between national interests and the international cooperation. Uh, we saw medical goods hijacked and political exploitation of the pandemic by some politicians and also social disorder within the country. Yeah, deglobalization, racial discrimination, and even some mutual censure based on conspiracy theories. And some countermeasures, as mentioned by uh, Stefan, you know, a huge amount of stu stimulus, financial resources are mobilized to fight against this kind of uh, pandemic. However, how to balance uh, the negative impact of these um, resources, you know, between the economic growth, the, 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 the infrastructure um, building and the climate change and how to make it more uh, justice and to contribute to social equality and, you know, how to 
um, make better use of these uh, huge amount of injection funds um, is challenging uh, that 2030 agenda without compromise to the uh, sustainable development. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, the mitigating measures, I think the first one, the top priority right now is trust building and mutual learning enhancement. Um, at the moment, I think it's too early to forecast, forecast what uh, post COVID-19 would be like, but at the moment what's going on is not very uplifting. And we see many people still see the issue only through the lens of ideological differences by politicize everything. If we, we look at China's success of fighting against COVID-19, we see um, it's in the effective mobilization of social resources. You know, we use the model when we conduct a foreign aid, uh, one uh, province, one country. Now we use one province, one city to help uh, Hubei. And those uh, provinces send medical staff, uh, grocery supplies, almost everything to one city of uh, Hubei province. And we also saw, saw the uh, widest participation of uh, volunteers, community workers. You know, this is um, what contributed to the fiscal success. We, we cannot say we are going to succeed eventually, but at least we see this is a fiscal success. But the details of the useful experiences were greatly ignored by many countries. Um, and the second, I think we need to innovate aid policy and aid ethics. It seems that development cooperation is uh, losing its um, ethical compass. Um, I, I don't know if I'm right or not. And, you know, we need to advocate win-win and mutual benefit principles to make aid more sustainable and accountable at the right moment. I think traditional aid um, uh, donor recipient paradigm actually has inherent um, inequality in it. Um, yeah. At this moment, we need to advocate. We say aid does not equal to free donation. Uh, we need to provide space for the providers uh, to at least to cover the cost so that aid can become sustainable. And also we see um, within China, we didn't uh, urge anybody you know, to contribute. We see if you don't force, in, force up the price, actually is an ethical behavior. And um, also we need a stronger and more capable world government. Um, this is the right moment to mobilize more resources and to, to direct the limited resources to the most vulnerable. Yeah, international organizations, particularly UN system, should be more um, proactive roles. Um, then I will elaborate how we can do this. Next slide, please. And we also reached and, eight minutes. Uh, okay, uh, we see that the, the uh, we see the threat of COVID nineteen is different from climate change. Climate change is invisible; you cannot feel it. But this one is visible, and almost no country exempt. I think this is the right moment to um, to solidate uh, the global solidarity, and all the countries are in urgent need of. Um, of instructions or um, development cooperation. And the poor countries need to be informed, to be heard, to be protected, and the rich countries to be directed, monitored, recognized. And countries like China and other developing countries um, call for a more uh, just and reli reliable platform to coordinate the action of development cooperation. So, um, and also we, we see some good sign you know, even we saw aid between rivals, UAE to Iran, US to Iran, China to US, US to China. So, and also uh, we saw the important roles of non-stick actors, um, private sectors, philanthropic organizations, volunteers, and medical staff. Next, please. 
Yeah, so the, the last one, we see um, a new type of global solidarity. We see more equitable, just and with widest participation and stronger leadership could be envisioned uh, post COVID-19. But we also face a lot of challenges. The first one, you know, COVID-19 coincides with the transition, transition period. Uh, global system is restructured. And we also facing the threat of economic recession and divisive uh, geopolitical hue at center. And now people are uh, talking about two competing narratives, uh, competing narratives. Should we unite it or should we be apart? But I see solidarity is the only choice. And uh, another one, yeah, people are talking about liberal or illiberal states to better manage extreme social distress. I think this is too early and irre irrelevant. We should set aside the difference and to fight together. Um, and the last one is fake news and misinformation are everywhere. Uh, how to better this? I don't have any solution. And but I'm very optimistic. We see never waste a good crisis, um, like said by Wesson Churchill. Thank you. I, I will stop here and look forward to more in the interaction later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chang Hong. I think it, uh, you know we could we could have a separate debate on almost uh, you know each individual conclusion from your uh, from your presentation because they are uh, they are all extremely uh, deep. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the curve of uh, of our attendees is uh, is actually uh, growing uh, right now. This is uh, uh, what I have to remind to our panelists that uh, that we need to be. Uh, strict on time. Uh, and with this, I would like to uh, give the floor to um, Dr. Dvapriya Patacharya from uh, uh, Bangladesh. The floor is yours. Thank you, Atomi. Uh, Stefan and colleagues at uh, Steel, thank you very much for organizing this. Very timely. Uh, the issue is just emerging and you have caught it just on by the tail in certain ways. So uh, I have heard with great interest Filani, I almost agree with all of that. I, there are sub points where we can debate. And uh, Chuan Hong uh, also gave a very structured presentation. But let me pick up from where Chuan Hong has left it, you know. And I want to engage those who are uh, at this moment on the other end who are listening to, uh, listening to us or if viewing us and have joined the discussion. So I want to put a question to them, you know, and I expect the response and the, if the organizers allow me that. You see, the broadly, the world is now divided into two groups, as usual. And some of us, we love dividing them into two groups. So the first group is consists uh, of the pessimists who are saying, after this crisis, the world will become more illiberal, Chuan was alluding to that. It will become more unequal. It will become more authoritarian. And it, we will see more aggressive competition in the world in that way. So there is no, no basic global rules as such. And also the voices within the countries will be throttled. So this is a very pessimistic uh, projection which we see, which, we, which is there. Uh, uh, the other pro optimistic projection is that that human beings are great, uh, wise guys, and they will at the, take the lessons very effectively, and they will create a new world, which is more inclusive, more participatory. They will allocate the resources where it is necessary, and it, it will become more environmental friendly. So there are two options which are going around broadly. I'm, I'm of course, uh, 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 exaggerating. One is the optimistic assumption that it will become uh, more unequal and aggressive and illiberal. The other is the pessimistic ob observation that we will use this opportunity to make the world more friendly and participatory and uh, etc. So what I'm calling upon the participants at this moment. Option one is the pessimistic outlook. Option two is the optimistic outlook. Please pick up your cursor, vote for it. Which one do you like? Wh uh, which one do you think will happen? Not that what you like, what will happen? a more realistic one. If you think it is one, please put one and send it to the uh, 
uh, to the organizer if in the chat if it is two you put it on the two we will kind of count them at the end of the discussions and see how what is the mindset at this moment now coming back to my point and i hope i won't be penalized for this couple of minutes which i have used in engaging the participants so let me make my grandmother's three points the first and foremost i think it is very obvious this crisis came at a time when the multilateralism was showing its weaknesses it was not only i agree with all the points which are saying that that it was that in fact we were discussing that international development cooperation is at an inflection point and no important was the fact that the world economy was going down because in the eu it is very difficult to do international cooperation when the whole economy the global economy is in a relatively a downtrend so i think this is what has happened in in that way now because of that we have seen the weaknesses on the one hand and i agree on the others the new emerging new realities on the other hand whether it is the south helping the north or the south doing more about the south or the south being left alone by themselves the poor economies and to struggle themselves in that way the adjustment is not only at the global level the adjustments at the household level at the local levels how people are really struggling with their livelihood in the lockdown and isolated quarantine conditions so that is that is very much there so i think that framework is so is very we all agree this is one major consensus we have at this moment over there and all the things the very fact that the i don't know whether the meeting of the security council took place today finally or not you may be knowing more is supposed to be after four months a security council meeting on covid and the g20 which we have in only in the last week a declaration for that matter in that way so we have seen that all other appendages are not really working let me come to the second point now what will happen will also depend to what extent uh, the extent of the damage it causes the trajectory of the how long it will get protracted will it will it end in end of may, april will it end in april may or it will be after the summer vacations you know the final covid infection will be over so we will see that how the peaking will take place whether the peak has already been behind us in the europe is it over there but what happened in the africa or ldcs because where they have started later so i think it will what will happen in the world will also depend upon the trajectory the the intensity and the duration of this crisis how much damage it will cause what ravage it will cause and it is a great leveler in certain ways because we it is affecting almost across the globe everybody so in that sense everybody has all of a sudden realized that they are all equal in a very unfortunate way so so th that is one part of it now coming back to that so uh, whatever may be the damage there is the second consensus now which is going around the second consensus is that the country the countries the world will go into recession this is the second concession which is uh, consensus which is around there the 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 dimension of the recession the depression is being debated some would refer it to the 1930s crisis some would refer it to the second world war some would refer to that much more protracted than the 2008 global economic and financial crisis it all depends how uh, what is your point of departure and how intensive and how you know how you know acute you think the thing will be so that it is there so basically it will bring us to the third point that what we what the development cooperation can do for reviving the global economy and what the development cooperation can do to reviving the national economies depending upon their you know the impact they have because of the covid regarding the global economy i think this is the third area of consensus which is emerging globally is that it will have to make a global economy which has more flow of finances because the whole approach is that you will have to go to a keynesian approach you will have to augment the demand by putting more resources into it that is the counter cyclical macroeconomic policies are in demand that will be in demand so essentially more finances has to come in so anywhere the finances are locked has to be released whether it is through debt and uh, you know debt write off or you know buying again the bonds and others or in sense of the other liquidity 
profusion we, which we want to do that will have to be. This is the major one, the putting more, putting more liquidity into the economic system and also within the countries as it goes. The second point is, of course, open trade. I think the WTO has said that the 30% plus would be the fall in global trade. So open rule-based global trading has to remain open and has to be functional. That is the second point. After finance, the trade issues over there. I think the third issue which has come up very strongly now is the intellectual property right issue. Because of the possibility of vaccines being you know, innovated in one part of the world, there are other issues which are coming from the other part of the world. So the flow of knowledge and access to this kind of life-saving drugs and other things and the intellectual property right regime should accordingly adjust over there. And we will see that these things are happening in certain ways. I think on the ODA in particular, I, what we see now in the countries, what is happening, that given the fact that the donor countries are, will be also needing money for their own internal bailout packages. So what is important at this moment to protect the commitments that there is no cutback. We are and at eight so, minutes. And, 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 and the second point is that there should be more flexibility of use of this money, which we are talking about and is happening, is retooling the programs in favor of the, in favor of, uh, the COVID effect and et cetera. Let me conclude by saying that also the last point which will, has be, will become very important is how the development cooperation will reorient itself to social protection, minimum wages, minimum income, and also to help universal health account. This priority will come out at the end. Let me conclude by saying, when this, this COVID hit us, before that, the discussion amongst those who were involved, engaged in the development cooperation discussion, they were, I was mentioning that in the CEOL conference that we, I see three options. Developing cooperation as an old game, with the old rules is one possibility, and it, is, it will not take us anywhere. So old game, old rules, nowhere to go. We were discussing at that time, old game with new rules, with new actors. I think what COVID has done is that it has grabbed those both the options. What we have now is, a, is an opportunity to create and a need to create new rules of the game and also the game itself. The game has to change. The game has to be re-established on the basis of, as has been Chuan Kong mentioning, on new ethical priorities. It has to come, the rationale has to be rethought, the modalities have to be rethought, and the outcomes of these modalities and the development cooperation has to be rethought in the light of this 2030 agenda, in the new way that nobody is left behind. I think this is, and I want to embrace these dark days with an illumination of optimism. Thank you. That's a perfect uh, summary, uh, Dr. Deb. And uh, uh, you can now uh, look at the, uh, both the, the Q&A and the chat function to see uh, the, the results of, uh, uh, of the um, survey uh, uh, that the people are voting, uh, as well as some uh, interesting uh, suggestions that they uh, provided there. Uh, so now, la last but not least, uh, I want to give the floor uh, to Jonathan Glennie. I will not attempt to uh, list all his uh, current affiliations, but uh, one, one thing that I want to say about him is that he uh, is the author of uh, one of the uh, early uh, papers uh, uh, that were written in the immediate aftermath uh, of, the, of the crisis. If you haven't read it, uh, I invite all of you to, uh, to read. Uh, so, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, you should be able to. If not, please let me know. I can share as well. Okay. Yes. Is that uh, shared? Can, yes. Is that working? It's your WhatsApp. Yes. So people can see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, um, well thanks, for, thanks very much, everyone, for, uh, for the invitation. Um, so I'm just going to run through quickly my, my overall, I guess, argument, and then a particular proposal that some of you may have seen before, but 
Um, I think is appropriate at this time. The danger, of course, is, is using COVID to prove what you've been saying for the last few years, which I think everyone is doing to some extent. I'm going to try and do that now. Um, the first thing is think big. Okay, so uh, w w a couple of days ago, G Gordon Brown and others suggested some kind of global government uh, with a, a quite astonishingly bold proposal. I cannot see it going anywhere, but I mean, it would be amazing if it did. Um, Spain has just proposed universal basic income, and I think it's more than a proposal. I think that it's, it's a decision to implement it, something that would have been unthinkable uh, a few uh, months ago. And across the world, we're seeing these huge interventions of public money. Um, so the idea that I'm going to present today was quite radical uh, a, a few years ago. And all of a sudden, for the first time, it feels like I'm not being ambitious enough. It feels too small fry compared to especially some of the presentations we've heard just now, kind of teeing up the need for major change. So we have to think big. It doesn't mean we'll get it. Um, the fundamental point, I think, is the resurgence of the public. Uh, the crisis is demonstrating the importance of public funds uh, during this crisis and beyond. And the question, I guess, that people will ask is if it's good enough to do a massive response to the COVID-19 crisis, why is it not good enough for persistent infant mortality, for instance, or all the, or all the chronic problems the world faces, climate change being another obvious one? The third, public interventions obviously have to be funded. Clearly, um, the national level is the most important and taxation at the international level is also the most important international part of that funding, in my view. But also, and this is the fourth point, we need to reaffirm the importance of grant financing. I used to say concessional um, international public finance. I, I now just say grants. It's, it's transfers of large amounts of money between countries for international development and sustainable development. We need much more of it and it needs to be managed differently. And I'm going to propose how, and, and previous panelists have said we need to basically a paradigm shift in the way we think about aid. And I, and, and I don't think there is a proposal out there yet, but I think that, that this, what I'm going to say now uh, does that. And then finally, you know, in answers to Deb's question, how's it going to play out? I mean, after the 2008 crash, I hoped people would finally get it. We all thought everyone would start regulating the banks. Actually, what we got was, you know, Modi, Trump and, um, and Bolsonaro and the kind of the, the, the right, more right-wing populism. We don't know how things will play out. It's, 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 it's a complicated political scenario, but this is the time, and someone's already mentioned uh, the Second World War, this is the time to think big. This is, this is a moment when Keynes and others put together the Bretton Woods institutions, and we need to be thinking at that level. And although we can't predict the future, it's certainly the moment to try and influence it. So, so in 2008, I wrote this book called The Trouble with Aid, because the need back then, as I saw it, was to push the international development community to look beyond aid, to, be on, to look beyond grant financing. And I think that was pretty successful. I mean, I was a minor, minor player. But overall, people are looking in much more detail at the things that the rich world can do for development that aren't just let's send money. So that's great. But this, now, and the reason why I'm working on what I'm working on, uh, the, the, the problem is almost the opposite. There has been a, there has been a kind of a, 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 a subtle um, reduction in pressure for continued global public finance, uh, especially grant finance. Um, and so what we need now, and I'm afraid, you know, tragically, COVID makes the case, uh, is a huge increase in funds available for global public goods and to support uh, all countries not just low-income countries. So why do I say that? When you look at what, we what we're talking about in financing the SDGs, everyone agrees that we need to move from billions to trillions. Everyone agrees we need more public spending at the domestic level, more private finance, more philanthropy, more remittances, an overhaul of international taxation. These are all things that pretty much there's consensus on now, if, if, even if there wasn't a few years ago. But when it comes to international public finance, the future of aid, there is confusion. Uh, and I'm going to try and explain why that is. In the MDG um, understanding of, of the world, uh, and really the, at the heart of any understanding of aid, this quote from Donald Kabaruka pretty much sums it up. Aid is not successful unless it has a sell-by date. If aid does not stop, it will have failed. And then Paul Collier, a very influential economist about uh, aid, said this, this basically no role for international development cooperation in middle-income countries. I would classify that as the traditional foreign aid uh, approach. And yet, 
under the SDGs, we have views such as those uh, on the right. Development only really begins when extreme poverty is eradicated. So a move away from this kind of narrow poverty focus. And then Martin Rivadian, among many others, and most of us agree with this, it's, is, is it not time to get beyond these arcane thresholds between low and middle income countries? So there's that kind of um, mis mismatch. So the proposal that I'm going to make, and I don't know how much time I've got, is called global public investment or possibly global contributions. We're not quite sure what, but it's a way of understanding all of the concessional and international public finance intended to promote sustainable development, including ODA and also South-South cooperation. And it's a way of doing what, what other panelists have already suggested, which is reframing and re-understanding uh, aid and really moving on from that word as well. Um, and the analogy that I use is the European Union. So the European Union is massively flawed. It's hugely imperfect. Britain has now got a large red cross on it. There are all sorts of problems with it. It's an analogy that I'm going to make now. But within the European Union, billions of euros are transferred annually between fairly wealthy countries and uh, countries of the east of Europe. And even in the south, Spain and Portugal are net recipients of that money. The aim is not to eradicate extreme poverty. The aim is to bring member countries to a similar living standard. Every country contributes, but poor countries make a net gain. So it's not a donor recipient relationship. It is a membership relationship. Even the poorest countries put money in and even the richest countries get money out. So Britain and Germany and Norway and, and net contributors actually receive money uh, back again, even though they're, they're they're net contributors. It's mostly grants, there are loans, and there are other what they call financial instruments, but the majority of it is grants. In terms of governance, because of the way it's set up, every country has a seat at the table. It's fundamentally different to the way that we think about foreign aid, which is kind of this charitable gift from the north to the south. This is about everyone pooling money and resources to contribute to a better Europe. And the analogy is clearly governance and accountability would be massively different at a global level. But the analogy is that we can think about th 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 those terms and those approaches at the global level. And it's already happening. So, so this looks a bit like a radical proposal, but at the same time, it's almost a description of some of the things that are already happening. We've, we've already heard about north-south uh, uh, resource flows. So this, this, is, this is actually a graphic that I haven't changed in about eight years. And the first time I put this up, uh, when I was working at ODI, it was really considered a little bit um, exaggerated. No one, I don't think, took it particularly seriously. But today, it feels like the right approach. The public understands what national public investment and spending is. And it's redistributive, and it is support for uh, national public goods. Let's make that analogy at the global level. Everyone put money in and everyone receive uh, according to need and according to capacity. We so are five at eight major minutes. Paradigm shifts. So I've got two minutes to go through five paradigm shifts and I'll do it very, very quickly. The first one is about ambition. It's not just about poverty reduction, even if that's the, the, the most important thing. It's a, it's a move towards uh, reducing inequality within and between countries and to sustainable development. And it's not just about national progress as in supporting countries to grow and perform better. It's about international goods as well. Secondly, about function. It's not just about the quantity. We make this huge mistake when we say, oh, well, you know, we can reduce aid because there's national public money or because there's private money. All, the, all types of money have their unique characteristics and international public uh, grants are unique. They can do specific things. Um, they can not just fill these huge budget gaps. They can also help to overcome traps. And crucially, we want to move away from thinking about aid as temporary to thinking about it as a permanent uh, contributor at the international uh, uh, level. And this very quickly are some, some, some special characteristics of, of international public finance that mean that it's particularly good at moments like COVID and uh, for all other sorts of purposes as well. I'll share this, these slides. On geography, we've heard it already, it's not about north-south, it's about universal, south-north, south-south. It's not about graduating from low income to middle income status, it's about managing uh, different need and middle income countries and even upper middle income countries need still very large transfers of grant money. And just to talk about big loans from the IMF that they have to pay, pay back is not good enough. Um, there's huge amounts of need in, in middle income countries and we have to build an approach over the next 30 to 50 years that responds to those needs. 
rather than basically says you've graduated from international help. Um, governance, it's got to move from voluntary gift to contributory membership kind of thing. I've got one, I've got one more slide, Artemy. And, and from a hierarchical governance um, uh, approach to a democratic one. And then finally on the narrative, let's stop using the word aid. Let's start to talk about investment. It's not donor recipient, it's collective responsibility. It's not charity, it's common interest. And crucially, it's not foreign aid, money thrown ab abroad to other countries. It's investment in our own global and regional uh, common good. I've had to run through that, but thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And, uh, uh, and yes, if with, with your permission, we will make the presentations available on our website after the, uh, after the webinar. Uh, now, as I promised, uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, we don't have time for the proper Q&A uh, session, uh, but uh, we have one person uh, that, uh, uh, wants, that uh, wants to ask a question, I think, and uh, um, uh, uh, Emmanuel Colley, I want to recognize uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, in case he wants to ask a question for uh, maximum 30 seconds. Emmanuel, please unmute yourself. Okay, for me, no, I was just, I was just re responding to the, the, the issue that had, that had to do with uh, uh, the two dimensions, which was uh, optimacy and, 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 and pessimism. So I was responding to it that I was taking the, 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 second, the second option. Uh, I, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we we got this. And uh, I also wanted to to give the floor to Stefan because he was collecting some of the inputs that uh, um, that we received from the Q and A and from the chat. So we received a lot of very uh, good inputs. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, um, I mean, this was really a very lively debate uh, in the chat panel, but also Q and A. Uh, just to uh, as a feedback to Deb. Um, from my counting, I think we have uh, 15 times the pessimistic scenario, around 12 times uh, is the optimistic, and four times uh, a mix of both. Um, so that's, that's at least my counting. Um, so not everybody was um, uh, voting. We, uh, we had around 155 to 160 participants, and out of them, so roughly uh, 40 responses. We, um, if you have a look at uh, Q&A, the channel, uh, we have a number of uh, great, great questions. Um, let me just pick a few of them. Uh, one question to Bilani, uh, lessons to be uh, uh, drawn from African pandemic uh, related experiences. Uh, can you be a bit more specific? Then we had a couple of questions like from Simon Maxwell and James Mackey related to the um, uh, fiscal space in uh, poorest countries after the immediate rescue. Um, so um, there are some expectations that um, the debt level will increase and uh, how to respond to it. Um, why didn't debt uh, uh, include this kind of thinking in his presentation? What are your responses with regard to those macroeconomic um, consequences of the COVID-19 situations. That would be in a nutshell some of the questions you will find many more in Q&A. Yeah? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we, we now have on, uh, on record uh, the information on, uh, uh, on you, uh, who is uh, the optimist and who is the pessimist. And uh, so this is uh, something that uh, after we, uh, we have this very no, strategic... Yeah, I tell me, this is a Chatham House rule. What, <laughs> yes, has, been, what has been said here remains here. <laughs> Definitely. Only right. the numbers goes. Yeah. And, uh, and Deb, you have, you have the point? Yeah, I, I do want you to. Uh, no, I, I think my colleagues and uh, Jonathan here also included they have said fantastic and I, can, I, I have gone through the responses very fast. Uh, I wanted to pick up two um, particular issues. One is, I think has come from no less than a person like Samuel Maxwell. Uh, Sam uh, has referred to his blog uh, where he 
uh, I think distinguishes between this group of optimists and pessimists. I also recommend the, that you all read that blog. So, and he says that we, two things. One, we need to distinguish between the immediate recovery, the rescue phase, and, and the post-recovery uh, uh, you know, resumption and uh, uh, upturn phase. So I think that is particularly correct because I mentioned that it all depends on how the trajectory will play it out will define the development cooperation in it, how it addresses the immediate issues and the immediate issues, whether it is more trade and trade in services and goods, or it is the more in terms of financial support, this is something we will have to see. In, at this very moment, the World Bank and IMF are, and also the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, they're you know, rolling out their windows, new windows, soft, soft money windows. And we, we will see how these, all these work out. We'll have to see the effectiveness of these new bailout measures which are coming out on that. So I agree with Sam, uh, um, with, uh, um, Sam Maxwell that this is, have to be distinguished. The number two point he makes is that be realist. I think <laughs> this is also related to the, the other two issues. This is the pessimist optimist debate. You know, here it coming. That do you want to be realist? and adjust to the reality and make your maximize within that, or you want to be optimist and take some risk and try to turn it around. So I remember, I want to quote somebody, a great person from Latin America. He said that I am a realist, so I think of the impossible. So th that is a gentleman, you know who it was. So we have to think of impossibles in the term, the, the, the design we have in our mind, which will be best beneficial for the people of the world in that way. And in the universal sense of the term, in the spirit of the 2030 agenda, that is the framework within which we will seek our realism. I uh, understand that. But there are many stakeholders. Many stakeholders will pursue, different stakeholders will pursue different types of designs. And that at the end will somehow we will go, go somewhere over there. And the last point was that somebody asked about the question that how to create new logic for a domestic support for the ODA. I think the, the, the domestic, uh, one major new constraint is of course the liquidity will be necessary for domestic reasons. So there will be more pressures, I, I understand. But more importantly, the whole uh, coronavirus had been a great leveler. It has been, it has demonstrated that you really cannot leave your life within yourself in the gated you know, uh, community. It will all come haunting you one day or another. And that is what is we are saying. This is the biggest message, I think, of our universal approach, which has come through for global development cooperation. This message has to be taken to, to our respective countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deb. And uh, uh, basically, you have uh, uh, provided excellent summary, and uh, the, the, which was supposed to be uh, the, uh, uh, my, my work, but you are already done it and we are unfortunately behind time. Um, we have the comment from uh, um, Simon Maxwell to uh, for, for the next time to make the chat function available to everyone in order to enable a more lively uh, debate. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's, a, it's very well taken. We, um, uh, we disabled it uh, on purpose this time because we were um, acting on a, on a similar comment asking us to disable it for, uh, for everyone um, uh, because it was um, uh, disturbing some of the participants for some of the other webinars. But, uh, but thank you very much. We will, we will try to encourage uh, more active debate on other um, webinars because we will, uh, this is the whole purpose of this, um, this webinar. Uh, we uh, will uh, have webinars on the 14th and the uh, 16th uh, of uh, April and uh, uh, a lot of uh, questions came with regards to where uh, the presentations uh, will be found uh, and they will be uh, published uh, on uh, the website of our uh, center, UNDP Soul Policy Center. Uh, and in case, of course, uh, uh, there are a number of presentations, uh, there are a number of questions that we were not able to answer. Uh, we will also try to uh, um, answer uh, them uh, through the website. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists and all the attendees uh, at this webinar. Thank you all very much. And we hope to see you at the next uh, webinars uh, on this very important subject. Thank you very much and thank, thank you to our viewers and
the contributors. Thank yes. you. Have a good day uh, and good evening. And thank, thank you, you so all. Much. I will be stopping the recording very soon. <laughs>